We pack up the gear and head to Southern Illinois for this episode of The Paw Report. Tucked away near the Crab Orchard National Wildlife Refuge, you'll find the Little Grassy Fish Hatchery. While many fish are raised here, the main event at Little Grassy is the catfish production. We'll take you on a tour of the facility and talk with hatchery manager John Ziegler about its history and production. So stay with us. The Paul Report starts right now. Fetcher's Pet Supply on the north side of the Charleston Square is serving the EIU community since 1991. Fetcher's welcomes all pets on a leash, is open seven days a week, and offers made in the USA food. Pet supplies for dogs, cats, reptiles, and fish. Fetcher's Pet Supply in Charleston. The Paw Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Well, as you've noticed, we've uh, stepped out of the studio, and I think this is a first for the Paul Report. We have actually traveled two and a half hours to Southern Illinois, near Carbondale, near Macanda, to the beautiful little grassy fish hatchery in Southern Illinois. And today we're gonna learn all about the hatchery, its production, and we're gonna talk to its hatchery manager, John Ziegler. So thank you, John, for well, you know, it's probably, we're recording here in the mid-August. It's probably the hottest day of the year so far. It's, uh, I think when I stepped out of the, the vehicle, it was in the 90-ish range. Feels a little hotter. So thank you for welcoming us on this hot yet beautiful day in Southern Illinois. You're welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you. And John, you're a new guest. As I said, this is our, our first time this far south. Uh, and we always like to put our first time guests on the spot to have them Tell us a little bit about you and your journey to get to the hatchery here in Southern Illinois. Yeah, so I grew up, you know, an outdoor lifestyle, hunting and fishing, hiking, and and then, you know, as a kid, I, I saw a, a district fisheries biologist with the state of Illinois give a, a, an electrofishing demonstration where they use electricity to catch fish for sampling mm -hmm. at a lake. And I thought that was really cool that you could do that as a job, work with fish or wildlife and that you, could, that you could make a career out of that. And so I, I pursued that as a career and I went to Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, so just up the road from here. Mm -hmm. uh, I got my bachelor's and master's degree there. Uh, I worked at a few places, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and um, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources and then made it back to Illinois. Uh, worked a few years on the Asian carp crew in Northern Illinois, trying to keep those under control and then made it down here to back to my home. I grew up in Marion, which is just a, a few miles away here. Um, so back to where I, I grew up, working at Little Grassy Fish Hatchery. How many of, uh, of you are here? So you obviously manage the facility, and we're gonna talk yes. in depth about that, but it's not just you, you've got some staff under you. Yeah, so I'm the manager. We have an assistant manager and five technicians. And the technicians, they carry out the bulk of the the, the work here, you know, moving the fish around and feeding the fish, doing what needs to be done, stocking the fish, um, all the maintenance on our equipment and facilities. Um, and then we also have an office coordinator who, who handles all the office side of stuff and we have a site interpreter who gives the tours. I tell you what, you couldn't have invited us to a better location to film our discussion today. It's just gorgeous behind us. Some of our viewers may not necessarily know what a fish hatchery is or does. So I'm going to turn to you and have, have you answer that question. Yeah, so a fish hatchery is a place that, that, that produces and rears uh, young fish. Um, state fish hatcheries such as us, we, we produce and grow out fish to a stockable size to stock at public water bodies, so lakes, rivers, um, 
and uh, small, smaller ponds that are owned or managed by the Department of Natural Resources for the state. So it's all state related. So. I, I'm a fisher person myself. I, I have a body of water on my home property, but this is not something that the general public can actually come to and just scoop up some fish for their own use. This is all waterways, state waterways. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's for the management of our, our publicly managed lakes. So it, it's to enhance those fisheries, uh, maintain and enhance those fisheries in those public lakes. I'd like to know a little bit about the hatchery here. Um, it was started back in the 50s, is that correct? Can yeah. you take us through the history of the facility? So it was established in 1959. At that time it was 10 ponds and it was one small hatchery building. Um, in 1962 it was renovated to add eight additional ponds and we also added a, a, a maintenance shop at that time. And then in 1971 through 1982 a large renovation took place that added an additional three ponds, uh, expanded the, the hatchery building to 14,000 square feet. Uh, the, we uh, also added 18 outdoor raceways, so large concrete um, tanks with water flowing in one end and out the other for rearing fish, um, the, which you can see behind us. Um, and also 20 indoor raceways and uh, two large incubation racks with uh, the capability of, of, of maintaining uh, up to 240 incubation jars, which we use for hatching, uh, incubating and hatching fish eggs for certain species. Um, it added a, a water treatment facility. Big place. Yeah. The other thing that I, I thought was really interesting, on the way here, we passed Little Grassy Lake. Is there a connection between the Little Grassy Lake and the Little Grassy fish hatchery. Yeah, so we are located below the Little Grassy Lake Dam. So um, we, all our water comes from Little Grassy Lake and it, it's, it's primarily gravity fed. Um, we do pump some water up to a head box on the roof to use inside the building sometimes, but the rest of it's all gravity fed and comes straight from the lake. So you did say that we're sitting out on the observation deck. You did say there are some indoor uh, raceways. Uh, yeah. within this facility? Yeah, so we have indoor raceways that are smaller than our outdoor raceways and that's where we'll either, you know, we have troughs and some of those raceways where we rear our really small fish and then uh, um, some of those other indoor raceways will we'll hold fish and once we harvest a pond we'll hold fish until they're ready to stock and, and then they're easier to load that way on the mm -hmm. trucks. This is a warm water uh, facility meaning you rear and raise warm water species of fish, correct? Yes. So you wouldn't be your your trouts, your um, muskies, those types of species here. Right, so we have two other fish hatcheries for the state of Illinois, so LaSalle Fish Hatchery in Northern Illinois. They produce our walleye and sauger, as well as some of the, nor uh, some of the warm water fish species for their portion of the state, the bluegill, red ear sunfish, black crappie, and uh, bass for their portion of the state. Um, and then Jake Wolf Fish Hatchery uh, raises the, the musky lunge, the, the northern pike, the, the trout and uh, the trout for Lake Michigan, the salmon for Lake Michigan. And then we, we specialize in the, the warm water species. So, um, so the same warm water species that the other two hatcheries produce as far as bluegill, red ear sunfish, and black crappie, and largemouth bass. But we also produce all of the channel catfish and blue catfish for the entire state. Well, the ponds and the raceways behind us are sure feeling the heat on, yeah. on a day like today. So it's a good thing that the warm water species are, are residing here. Yeah, it's what? just a, a little more efficient, you know, <laughs> yeah, for us right. being so far south. We, we have a longer growing season, so it makes more sense for us to grow the, the catfish species as we can get them to a bigger size than what you'd be able to in central or northern Illinois. There is a lot that goes into this operation that you oversee. So from infant steps to what's behind us, talk about how production works here at the facility. Um, how many ponds? How are these ponds split between the different species? So we have 21 ponds now and we have 18 outdoor raceways and those are what we use for most of our fish production. So 
some of our ponds we hold our adult fish and we will keep them there until it, they're ready to spawn and then we'll move them either to raceways or to ponds to spawn. Um, and then other ponds will hold our fingerling fish as we grow them out uh, to a stockable size. Um, we also use, you know, we'll, we'll use our raceways for spawning some of our species and for growing out uh, species of fish. Now what about the the portion of the hatchery that's inside? So we, uh, inside, that's where we incubate and hatch um, certain eggs, so primarily the catfish eggs, the channel catfish and the blue catfish eggs. And then we also rear the, the young, the really small fish, the really small fry for the first few weeks inside in, in the smaller tanks. And then we'll use those tanks for holding fish as we harvest ponds as well until we're able to stock them out. What's key about making sure that the ponds and the raceways behind us are a perfect environment for the fish? I guess meaning water temperature, is it oxygen levels? How deep are the ponds? Do you, do you have a problem controlling like uh, blue-green algae or planktonic or any sort of other uh, issues that may arise in these areas. What about in the winter time when they freeze? Are they, is there aeration systems within them to maintain all of those things? And so we monitor those water quality parameters. The most important of those is oxygen. Um, we also monitor temperature pretty heavily. Um, so, you know, our temperature is, is it's dependent on nature. We can't really control that very well. We can add some cold water to flush through the ponds to keep the nutrients from building up as much and it keeps the temperature down a little bit. Um, but primarily the, the thing that we monitor the most is oxygen. So, the, I mean, that's what's most vital for the fish to live and grow. Um, so we, we measure that with, with dissolved oxygen meters on a, on a daily basis, multiple times a day in all of our ponds and our raceways that have fish in them. Um, if the oxygen levels get low, then we, we have electric aerators in each pond that we can turn on to, to add oxygen to the water. They stir the water up, adding water from the atmosphere into the, the water. So by osmos osmosis, if the water has low oxygen and you stir the surface of it, oxygen from the air will want to want to go move to the water by osmosis. Um, we also have diffusers in the ponds. We have large pond blowers that blow air and the diffusers in the bottom of the ponds. Uh, so mostly our aeration takes place at night because during the daytime you have photosynthesis, it's producing oxygen and it's, um, you know, that increases throughout the day. And then in the evening when the sun goes down that stops. So we, if we have to aerate a pond, typically it's in the evening. And so at our last check of the day, we'll see what ponds need aeration and we'll turn on aerators. We'll turn on our air system that blows into all the ponds as needed kind of take us through a typical day when you come in you meet with your technicians are they are they just walking the the, the premises most of the day checking things and so first off in, in the morning we'll we'll meet and 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 set out our plan for the day but our, we'll have one technician go and check all the, the dissolved oxygen temperature in all of our ponds and our raceways anything that has fish in it at the time and then We'll also have a technician go around and they'll, they'll feed all the ponds and raceways that we're feeding at the time. Um, then they'll move on to other things. So um, this time of year, we're, we're stocking a lot of fish out. So we'll, um, we'll load the fish on the trucks and, and get them on the road early in the morning. We start at six o'clock this time of year to get them on the road and, and get them stocked out uh, at a timely manner. And um, then, you know, whoever is not out on a stocking run uh, and after the ponds are all checked and fed, then the, we'll work on other maintenance projects on site if needed um, and take care of it, anything else that needs to be done. Each species, do they all eat the same stuff? Yeah, so, you know, in, the, in some of our species, we don't even need to feed them, like our sunfish species. They, they live off natural diet for the most part. We may fertilize the ponds early on to get a, a plankton bloom started in the ponds. So, you know, the, the phytoplankton will, will grow from that fertilizer and then the zooplankton will eat that phytoplankton. And so the early stages of fish, they'll, they'll feed on that zooplankton. Um, a lot of our fish species early on, they'll feed on that zooplankton primarily. Um, and then they'll, as they get bigger, they'll start feeding on larger insects and other, other food items that, that just grow in the pond. Um, 
but then a lot of our species will will transition them to either a pellet diet or, or minnows our bass will feed minnows to grow them out to four to, in, four to six inch size um, our catfish though they live on pellets almost exclusively you mean um, not stink bait no <laughs> you don't throw any of that yeah. in there no so we we get a commercial uh, commercially produced uh, diet starting out early it's a high protein diet um, and it's it's a powder at first so oh. it has to be really small for them to eat when they're first hatched and they develop and they when they first uh, absorb all their yolk sac and start feeding they'll, they'll need that really small powder to feed off of and that'll get them trained on that commercial feed and then we'll move them out to ponds and from there we'll, we'll continue to feed them larger and larger pellet sizes as they grow um, at the same commercial feed and um, and they'll also feed on some natural um, prey items in the ponds as well. Um, and Frogs. When they get, yeah. <laughs> when they get to the raceways, then it's, it's exclusively pellets that they're, they're feeding on. Let's rewind just a, a little bit back to the production. And if you could explain to our viewers the difference between the intensive, the extensive culture methods. Yeah, so extensive fish culture refers to culture that doesn't have a lot of input from us. So it, so a good example is our bluegill, our red ear sunfish, and our black crappie ponds. So we, we raise those species primarily in ponds here on, on the site. And so we'll have our adult fish in the ponds already. They'll spawn in the spring or early summer. And then we'll leave those adults in there, let, them, let the fingerlings that are hatched grow out throughout the summer. And then at the end of the summer, in the early fall, usually early October, we will, we will harvest those ponds, take the fingerlings out, we'll stock those across the state, leave the adults in for the next year. And so that requires very little input from us besides maybe a little fertilization, very little feed going into those ponds. They usually don't require much aeration because they aren't, you know, we're not putting a bunch of nutrients in through additional feed that we're adding. Um, so that would be extensive fish culture. And on the other hand, intensive fish culture requires a lot of input from us so a good example of that is our channel catfish production so we we facilitate the spawning in our raceways we hatch the eggs inside we we rear the the small fry inside for a short amount of time and then and then we grow them rather intensively in the ponds even you know we continue to feed them a uh, uh, high diet of protein you know that the high protein pelleted feed in the ponds throughout the summer in the fall and then um, we'll also move those up to our raceways where we'll, we can grow them out a little bit quicker, we can feed them a little bit more heavily. And so the majority of their, their food comes from us. Um, it requires a lot more labor and inputs from us um, and even you know, aeration, you know, more electricity usage for aeration. Um, it's just a lot more intensive process. So that's, that's the difference between those. And, and in between those two extremes, we raise our largemouth bass and our blue catfish, still primarily in ponds, and you'd probably consider those more extensively raised fish, but they, they, they're still somewhere in between the two extremes. We do feed them more. We do facilitate the spawning process a little bit more than we do our sunfish species. On the channel cat, that's kind of the, your feather in the cap here is kind of your hatchery, your, your species that's the most popular. But I was reading, um, on your website about uh, using milk jugs. Is that, mm -hmm. you, you use the milk jugs, you kind of plant those with the hope that the fish will lay their eggs in those jugs. Is that, maybe yeah. you can explain the milk, the milk jug in this process. Yeah, so uh, the channel catfish are cavity spawners. So they like to go into a cavity and build a nest. And then the male, the male does that part. He'll go in and build the nest and then he'll attract a female in and they'll spawn inside that can, lay the eggs in there and fertilize them. And then the female will leave and he'll stay and guard the, the, the nest in there until they hatch, until they're able to absorb their yolk sacs and start swimming away from the nest. Um, so a milk can works really well for that. Uh, the, we use 10 gallon milk cans and it's just right for the channel catfish that we spawn. Uh, they're usually about four to 14 pounds and they fit well inside those. A pair can go inside there. It necks down so that you know they can go in there and it opens up and that's just, the type of, act, uh, type of cavity that they, they tend to prefer for spawning. It works really well for that. We can also use small barrels for some of our larger catfish that can't fit inside the milk cans. And then our blue catfish, we use 
uh, like 55 gallon drums or large wooden boxes that we've made for those to spawn in um, because they're, they're quite a bit larger. They range from like 15 to, to 60 pounds, the fish that we use for, for spawning for those. So, Let's go over specifically, uh, we've dabbled in a lot of different species here at the hatchery, specifically the fish that you rear here, mm -hmm. the different types. So we raise bluegill. Um, I mean, that's what a lot of people get started fishing on. They're, you know, common. They're almost every little pond or lake or stream in, El in Illinois. Um, you know, so, and they're easy to catch as a kid. They're, they're prolific spawners, so. They're little fighters. They, you think you yeah. got a big shark on your line when, when yeah. you catch one. Yeah, and they, they spawn in, in like community bedding. So they're, they're, when you find one spawning, there's a bunch of them and they're easy to catch and, and they're, they're fun to catch. Um, they're, they're good to eat. Um, then red ear sunfish is another species, a sunfish species we produce. They're pretty similar to bluegill with a few slight uh, physical differences, you know, different coloration. Um, and also they, they, they only spawn one, so bluegill will spawn, they'll have multiple spawning waves throughout the spring, summer that come in and spawn and then leave. So bluegill kind of spawn throughout the summer a little bit more, a little more prolific that way. But the red ear will just come in and spawn once in a similar bedding structure. Um, but some people call red ear shell crackers, and part of that's the difference <laughs> in the diet. So blue, bluegill is pretty omnivorous. They eat all kinds of little bugs and stuff for the most part, even small fish. Uh, red ear, they like to eat uh, small mussels and snails a lot. Um, they eat a lot of bugs too, but they, since they eat small mussels and, and snails and stuff, they call them shell crackers. Um, sometimes we're uh, you'll find a lot of red ear. You'll find like little mussel beds. It's a lot of a lot of little mussel or snail shells where they, where they've been feeding. Um, they've got a little bit more muscular mouth for like for eating that type of prey. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll grow just a little bit bigger than bluegill. Uh, uh, you know, typically you won't see them much over a pound, but you know they they will get over that sometimes. Um, black crappie, another species we produce. They are uh, another really sought after food fish species. Um, they're found in most l larger lakes in Illinois. They don't do very well in small impoundments. They do too well in small impoundments. So we don't recommend them in ponds because they'll, they'll overpopulate. overpopulate and outcompete the other species. Um, but they do really well in large reservoirs and they, they're, you know, they're prized food fish species. So people will go after those primarily to, to eat. Um, they're, and they, they like structure. So people um, can figure out where they're hanging out. They find like underwater structure where they hang out and there'll be a bunch of fish there and they, they sit on that spot and use their, their depth finders and everything to find those, those fish and, and, and catch them. Uh, largemouth bass, I mean, it's, it's a, another commonly sought after species for sport fishing. It's, it's real common for, you know, a lot of catch and release fishermen go after them. They're not as prolific as bluegill, so they can't handle as much harvest as bluegill and red ear and, and crappie can. So that's why a lot of times on our lakes you'll see limits, uh, more restrictive limits on bass than you will a lot of the sunfish species because they're higher up on the food chain so there just aren't as many. It can't support as many bass as what it can the smaller prey species. You know, they got a big mouth so they like to eat a lot of stuff and so they're fun to catch. Um, and Channel cat? Channel catfish, yeah. The, the, uh, another uh, sought after f the species for their food. Um, uh, you know, it, it, people have their preferences and what they like to eat, but a lot of people like crappie, other people like catfish. Um, they're, they're fairly easy to catch, a bottom feeder typically, so um, you throw out uh, something with a weight and, and some and smell, uh, some smell <laughs> on the bottom, and they'll come along and feed it. They, they feed pretty aggressively at night a lot of times, um, and they'll get, you know, maybe 10, 15 pounds pretty commonly. Uh, the, uh, the state record is is uh, 45 pounds, but usually you don't see many over 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, blue catfish, they're more of a large river species than the channel catfish. Um, they're found in large rivers and reservoirs mostly. Um, the blue catfish, they feed a little more on, on fish, uh, forage fish than what the channel catfish do. Channel catfish are omnivorous. They'll eat just about anything they can find. Um, the blue catfish, they, they like a little more live prey, a little more uh, fish in their diet. Um, and they get quite a bit bigger. Um, so the state record blue catfish is 124 pounds wow. from the Mississippi River. Now, are they really blue? 
That's what everybody's um, going to ask. They, they typically, They're kind of whitish. Yeah, so sometimes the color can be hard to distinguish between a channel and a blue catfish. But typically, the, the blue catfish are more of a, like a steel blue color on the, on the, on the top part of their body. Um, the channel catfish will have, have some spots on them, especially when they're, they're smaller. A lot of times, they'll have little speckles on them. The, the blue catfish will have a nice straight bottom on the anal fin, whereas the, the channel catfish, it's, it's curved on that anal fin. Well, John, we're going to hit the pause button because there is a lot more to talk about here at the Little Grassy Fish Hatchery. And we hope our viewers at home will stay with us for part two of Paw Report on the road at the Little Grassy Fish Hatchery just south of Carbondale, Illinois. We'll be back next week with more. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, Authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. The Paw Report on WEIU is supported by Rural King, America's farm and home store, livestock feed, farm equipment, pet supplies, and more. You can find your store and more information regarding Rural King at RuralKing.com. Fetcher's Pet Supply on the north side of the Charleston Square, serving the EIU community since 1991. Fetcher's Welcomes All Pets on a Leash is open seven days a week and offers made in the USA food. Pet supplies for dogs, cats, reptiles, and fish. Fetcher's Pet Supply in Charleston.